Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to CRAM. Thanks for joining me as we explore new and innovative research and big ideas that may change the way you think and act. While they are small and insignificant, most of us don't think twice about these words in the English language. Pronouns like I and you, or prepositions like of and at, even the articles an and the are pretty forgettable. But these invisible words can reveal and even predict our behavior and our health. That's according to social psychologist Jamie Pennebaker, who has spent years studying the way we use words and their impact. He and his team of researchers have analyzed thousands upon thousands of pieces of text, and they've come up with some startling findings. Professor Jamie Pennebaker is with the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas in Austin, and one of his most popular books is called The Secret Life of Pronouns, What Our Words Say About Us. Hello, Jamie. Hey there, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, let's talk about early in your career uh, when you were fascinated by what happened when people who experienced trauma wrote about it. Tell us what you discovered. Well, it's one of these projects that I really stumbled upon, but the, the net effect was I first had found out that people who had had major traumas in their lives and who had not talked about them had more health problems than people who did talk about them. And so it occurred to me, if that's true, why not just bring people in the lab and have them talk or maybe write about upsetting experiences and see if that improved their health? And that, that's exactly what I did. So we brought people in the lab and we asked them to write about the most traumatic, upsetting experiences of their lives, ideally some that they had not talked to other people about in any detail. And we had them write for four days, 15 minutes a day. And then we had a control group that wrote about uh, superficial topics for the same amount of time. And we got permission from them to track their, their going to the physician, the, the student health center. And what we found was that writing about traumatic experiences resulted in people going to the doctor at about half the rate in the months afterwards. And these effects were shocking to me. And, um, and what was so interesting about it was it had this transformative effect on a number of the people who participated. And we did other studies and other labs started to replicate the effects. So it's a fairly trustworthy effect that shows that putting upsetting experiences into words can improve our health. It helps us sleep better. It helps us essentially get through those experiences. Did you manage to narrow down exactly what it is that causes that effect? You know, I don't know if it is it the act of writing. Is it the content of what they're writing about? The answer is yes. It's that and much, much more. You know, it's interesting in science. We're always trying to find the magic bullet, this, the exact principle that's driving an effect. But what I discovered over the years was there were a lot of things that were going on. One of them was just the mere acknowledgement of an upsetting experience is important. The second is to label it and to put it into words. You know, a lot of times we'll have some type of upsetting experience. We don't tell others. But we keep thinking about it, obsessing about it. Just writing it down can make a big difference. And it helps us, once you put it into words, it helps you to organize the experience. You get a sense of how it's been affecting you in these different kinds of ways. And so now you have, it's in words. There's structure to it. It's organized. And once you once it's in that format, if you like, it's easier for us to get through it, to get past it, because we're no longer trying to figure it out. We've kind of figured it out and we sleep better. We have more of what we call working memory. and We're able to uh, think better. Students make better grades after doing this kind of writing. Uh, it, so it brings about all of these unexpected changes in addition to improved health. I want to know about these, what we called forgettable words, these pronouns, and then how you were able to look at, you know, how often they were used, I guess, how they were used, and then somehow link that to people's um, emotional state, to health outcomes, all that. What I was interested in was, what can we tell about a person by the way that they use language? So 
I started this early work. Uh, it's it, again another contact issue. When I started this, uh, uh, desktop computers were just starting to become quite popular, and this was also in the mid '90s. Is when the internet started to appear out of nowhere, and those two uh, technological shifts had a profound effect on the entire field of psychology, but certainly with me in terms of language, because it allowed, it allowed me to analyze language in ways I never had. And one of the big breakthroughs, and anybody above a certain age remembers this, is when America Online became a, a, a phenomenon, AOL. America Online had this network system so that you would be able to connect to uh, to people all over the world and you could have conversations and they had these little conversation rooms where they had 22 people in them and you could go to different different types of rooms there could be one for singles there could be another one for sports there could be another one for politics and there were millions of them i was fascinated by this i'm a social psychologist and you saw natural conversations kind of natural conversations and every night after the kids were in bed I would now go and I'd start just downloading a particular set of uh, chat rooms. So I could get chat rooms of predominantly women and other predominantly men, those who were into sports and so forth. And then the next morning I would analyze it with the loop program. And I started to discover language did not work the way that I thought it did. I would have put a large amount of money on the fact that Men and women differ in the way they use language. So the first thing, of course, I looked at was uh, emotion words. Everybody knows women would have be more emotional than men. No, we didn't. I didn't find that. How did you determine that? I just went in and calculated the percentage of of uh, let's say positive emotion words that women and men use, and they are generally pretty much the same. Hmm. Or negative emotion words, pretty much the same. Now. Nowadays, when now that I've got uh, giant, giant, giant databases, there are some differences, but they're very, very subtle. Men actually use anger words a little bit more than women. Women use anger sad words. Word. Yeah, anger words like well, hate, kill, murder, um, mm. furious. Uh, but the differences. It's important to note that differences are pretty small. Hmm. Uh, so then I thought, well, at least one thing I know is men obviously use I words a lot more than women do because everybody knows men tend to be more self-important. They're more, uh, you, you know, they're always talking about themselves, whereas women are more selfless. And what I find is that women use I words a lot, a lot more than men did. And I thought that I did what every scientist did. I discovered that and I thought, huh, well, this is a complete fluke. And then, you know, the next night I would do some other, get other data sets and analyze again. And women use I words more than men. It made no sense. And I kept doing this over and over again. And there's just so many times you can dismiss it at the flu. And we words, everybody knows women would use we words more than men. They don't. There's no difference. And it went on and on. And what I just started to discover was that the way we think language worked is very different than how it works. So I words do, so somebody who is an arrogant, pompous person does not use I words more because I words reflect self-focus. When you are looking inwardly, you're being reflective. You use I words. And there are times when attention is drawn to us. So for example, if I'm in physical or emotional pain, if a person is physically sick, go talk to them. They, they use I words all the time. Read their emails. They use I words. If they're depressed, they use I words. If they're self-conscious, if you have people stand in front of a mirror and write or sit in front of, of a mirror and write, they use more I words. In other words, it is a marker of self-focus. Why can't both be true, though? Why can't people who are arrogant and self-absorbed also use a lot of I words? Or, or has because that been discounted through your research? It's, we don't find it. So, mm. what you know, an arrogant person is they're busy looking down at others. 
you know, they want other people to pay attention to them, but they don't use I words at, at, a, at particularly high rates that, you know, they're they're talking about you and he and she, but they're not looking. They're not uh, looking at the, they're not looking at themselves in a self-reflective way. So, oh, that's person, so fascinating. Yeah, no. So, so Jamie, did you find then that because it, 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 I guess it sort of turned even your beliefs about men and women and the way they talk, they turned it on its head in studying these words. Did it give you more of a window on how men and women think? It, it did there. And there's, there's another issue as well. So women use I words more. They also use uh, social words more, something that, that we all knew, you know, references to other people, he, she, they, words such as that. But there's this, and that's the only predictable thing that we got. So there were huge differences between women, men and women in terms of articles and prepositions. Men use articles and prepositions at re- very, very high rates compared to women. And if you're like me, you think, so what the hell does so that what? even mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it's really important because women are more self-reflective and they look more at other people. They talk about other people. And there's another, or there's one other part of this puzzle that just fascinated me. These cognitive words, words like because, cause, effect, realize, understand, meaning. These are all cognitive words. Who uses those words a lot more than the other? I would have thought men. No, women use those words at much higher rates than men do. Okay, so then what's the explanation or what? What? why do you think women use more of those cognitive words? Because it's what we are paying attention to. Women are really interested in other human beings compared to men. You know, we, we don't have anything against other human beings. We're just not that interested in them. What are we interested in? We're interested in objects and things. And objects and things are nouns, and you need articles and prepositions to talk about objects and things. Now, what's more mm-hmm. complex, an object or thing, or another human being or a human relationship? If I'm trying to understand why my tire is flat, I don't need to have a very elaborate theory. You know, I don't. Uh, whereas if I'm trying to understand why. Maria has broken up with Fred, and which makes no sense because Fred is such a wonderful guy. That requires so much cognitive effort and so many causal models to try to figure out. In other words, human relationships are far more complex than objects and things, even though we'd like to convince, especially women, that no, trust me, uh, rocket science is far more complex than human relationships. That ain't true. Mm. You know what might be very interesting, and I don't know, I, to, to because you studied at the differences between men and women. Have you done that moving beyond this kind of binary model? Uh, I haven't. And I, the reason is, first of all, this work is, was done in the past. The big issue right now is the base rate of uh, non-binary people and discussions is exceptionally low. But mm. as we move forward, we can, we can start doing mm-hmm. that. Okay, and l- let's just move on a bit because there's and, like, and, so and much. I should to also come. tell you, anything that I find or somebody else will find, I guarantee you will piss off a lot of people. <laughs> no matter what the result. <laughs> no matter what you find. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, well what about what about the area of politics because you you've done some fascinating work there too and I read in your book a, a really interesting story about the former US presidential candidate John Kerry. So I love this story. John Kerry uh, was running for president and against George Bush. And uh, Bush was uh, one thing about Bush is that he was, he's always been kind of charming and, you know, appears down to earth and, and warm. And Kerry was a really stiff. Now, you know, I mentioned how men and women didn't differ in their use of the word we. And the reason is there's two types of we. One type of we is really you and me together. You know, we, 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 we really care about each other. And we're a team. You know, 
Exactly. And you and I both know who the we is. But then there's this other kind of we, the we that I talk to my students about. Okay, guys, we need to analyze that data. Now, now that doesn't mean I'm going to analyze the data. It means, hey, guys, you have to analyze the data. Or talking to my son when he was, when he was young. Okay, Nick, we need to take out the trash. That, I'm not going to take out the trash. <laughs> right, right. Would the extreme form of that be, we are not amused? <laughs> That's right. And it's all the same thing. It's this psychological distancing, and politicians mm. do it all the time. Now, what's interesting is we as human beings hear the politician use we, and we're all thinking, is that me or is that not me? And it probably isn't. And so when we hear a politician use we, we kind of stand back. So I was reading in the New York Times about uh, that uh, Kerry's advisors, you know, they, they weren't... Uh, they they saw that he was pretty stiff and not very human. And so they were pushing him to use we words at an elevated rate. And I looked at that thinking, oh, God, he's screwed. Because they were essentially giving him information to make him be even more standoffish and untrustworthy. Whereas, but was their thinking, was their thinking, Jamie, that using we would be, oh, it's inclusive. We're all that's together. Exactly right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Okay. And, you know, and you hear this all the time. You know, there is no I in team. And, you know, that it's important to talk about we. It's we is a it, it's a dangerous word. If your audience knows who the we is. Yeah, that's great. But if they don't. And if that we is really you, and what I love about this is this is not conscious. You know, we're, we're not sitting there in the audience thinking, oh, he used mm. we. However, this is, this is what all the numbers show, is that people don't trust people who use, use we in this impersonal way. Yeah, because, you know, when I think about it, I, I guess you might infer there's there's a kind of abdication of responsibility, right, when you use the word we. And for and you want to hear a politician say I because they are taking responsibility for their actions. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's very interesting. One of my students who was involved in a lot of this work uh, was Cindy Chung. Cindy grew up in a Korean household, and uh, she educated me about the dangers of we that using the word we in Korean is a high risk game because it is viewed as a really presumptuous word. And, you know, in, in English, you know, never, never crossed my mind that it was presumptuous, mm -hmm. but you can <laughs> see why it is. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and what about uh, when you looked at the language of, of of recent presidents like Barack Obama and Donald Trump, and and in I know you've even tracked you know speeches and and how there's been a a shift over the years in in the kind of language that's been used in politics. Talk about that. So this work was spearheaded by one of my former students, Kayla Jordan, who's now at Harrisburg University, and she this project was a fabulous one. Where what we did was to look at two features of language. One is what we call uh, analytic language. This is really complex, uh, hierarchical, formal kinds of thinking. This is the language you use when you're trying to figure something out and you're, you have a complex understanding of it. And the other kind of language is the language of status and power, which is what we call clout. This is when you're a leader, it's generally associated with kind of a, a sense of certainty and it's not arrogance. It's just a, uh, when you, when, when somebody speaks this way, when they go into a room, other people look at this person and they, they tend to respect the person as having higher status. Would what, the language be more black and white? No, it's, it, it's, no. What it is is, uh, it's, uh, people high in clout do not use I words much. They use mm. you and, and he and she, but they are, a person who is higher in status, both man and woman, is standing back and they're looking at others. If they're a leader, they they care about the other people in their group, but and they're not talking about themselves. They're not they're not being self focused. Now, if you look at what's happened in terms of who we've elected, just looking at we uh, 
Kayla looked at inaugural addresses, going back to George Washington, looked at uh, press conferences, looked at uh, presidential papers, and did the same thing with leaders in uh, England, Canada, and Australia. And she finds the same thing, that over time, in terms of analytic thinking, it, analytic thinking was very was quite high in leaders in the United States until about the early 1900s. And all of a sudden, analytic thinking started dropping almost in a linear way. In other words... Why? Do you know why? Why it started dropping? Well, there's there, there's two or three good hypotheses. What this means is, is that, that uh, leaders started using simpler and simpler language. And they... And it's interesting because we all think of uh, Barack Obama as being very bright, but his language was really simple. Not as simple <laughs> as Trump. It, and actually, this study was started because, you know, this sense was Trump is so different than anybody else. But, you know, ironically, in terms of uh, simple language, he, he was right on that line next to Obama and George Bush and Reagan and Clinton and so forth. In other words, people are getting simpler and simpler. And by the way, we like people who speak simply. Almost all the people who have won elections, their opponents spoke more complexly. Now, and, would that be also across like um, demographic? I'm thinking about education. Are you saying right across the board, whether you have little education or a lot of education, you like simple language from politicians? Um, we haven't looked at that. My guess is there's still that bias that hmm. it, if somebody speaks simply, and I'll be honest with you, as a scientist, if another scientist can speak simply, I'm... I am swayed by them more than if they have really complex, you know, when they're, when they're over complexifying. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, I really like to kind of parse that, um, you know, because I'm wondering, is it because you can understand it better? Is it because we associate simple terms with being trustworthy? Uh, you know, there's, I, I think it's, and that's another part of the story could, because the, the set, the second side of the story is this, uh, whereas, Complexity has gotten less and less. We're liking liking uh, leaders who are simpler. We like them also with more clout. <clears throat> In other words, they're more certain of themselves and more confident. And that's one thing uh, that both uh, Obama and Trump have in spades. Both of them are completely, were really confident. And, uh, and which means this is, this is not so much a story of our presidents. This is a story of who we as voters like. Yes. That yeah. we're suckers for people who have a, a simple message and they say it with confidence. And this is Okay, but hold J Jamie, can I ask you, is it also a story? Yeah, it's not necessarily a story about whom we elect, but is it also a, a reflection of ourselves and yeah. our state? Right, it of is, who it, we are. It, it is. It, it. I. I. So one of my favorite foods are Cheetos. I find Cheetos <laughs> one of the most amazing inventions. And okay, sure, they are bad for you, but they are salty. They're crunchy. There's a bit of sweetness to them, and that's what we're electing. We are electing our Cheeto leaders, which they are. <laughs> they are confident and they are simple. And to be honest, just like Cheetos aren't good for us, we shouldn't be electing confident, simple leaders. And so I find this. But well, this is, I don't know. I mean, just to. OK. Um, do, is language necessarily the person, though? Just because uh, the language is simple, does that necessarily <laughs> mean the person is? I would say sometimes. In other words, those words coming out of these leaders' mouths are reflecting who they are. And, um, and I find that and that's just that's just because people might disagree with you and say Barack Obama was not a simple person. 
No, he was. I, I would agree with. I would agree with those people. He was not a simple person, but he conveys ideas in a in a really simple, digestible way. You know, uh, look at his books. He's a great writer, and his books are really. I mean, they are. It's a simple, straightforward story. Now we know the guy's smart as he can be, uh, but he also. This is the way he. You know, you talk to people who have uh, or have spent their lives with him, and they also point out that he is really good at telling stories. He's really good at, you know, boiling things down to its essence. So he's very smart, but he's also he conveys a very simple idea. And he won the election because he could he could tell a simple story. And, you know, I, w- I want to move on here because we, we've got to get to the pandemic and, and some really interesting work you've done looking at the effects of COVID-19 on language. Tell us about that. So over the course of my career, I've studied lots of disasters and upheavals. 9-11, uh, Mount St. Helens volcano was my first one. It, so, so I've always been intrigued with them. And when I saw the pandemic coming, I I had sworn off disasters, but this one was too good to to pass up. Oh well, it's I, a social psychologist dream, social is psych- it not? <laughs> it really is. It's the perfect experiment. Okay, um, and I mean that really just for the nature of science. It's been a yes. horrible, horrible experience. But from a scientific perspective, it's been remarkable. And I've been working with a number of students, uh, in particular uh, Ashwini Ashokumar, and Ashwini and I. Uh, from the very beginning, jumped into this with both feet by giving out millions of questionnaires, but also tracking social media. And my favorite one is Reddit. And to all you listeners out there, if you uh, don't use Reddit, I encourage you to do it because we can always use more data. <laughs> <laughs> so what Reddit is, uh, is it's it's essentially a social media site that you, you go to and they are, it's, it's like, a juiced up America online where you have all of these uh, subgroups called subreddits. And there are about 200,000 of them now and every conceivable topic it is available. So you can go in and have long discussions about Seinfeld or polo or uh, assault rifles or you name it. There's, there's a subreddit for you for COVID what we were interested in was how do people react to it? So what we were able to do was to go in and we looked at about 23 cities and these, so Austin and Houston and New York and Chicago and and major cities that have active Reddit communities. And we went back to 10 years ago and we have them up to now. And then we were able to go through and see how, the culture and how each of these cities changed in their use of language over time up until the beginning of COVID. Then we can track what happened once COVID started. And some of the things that happened are not surprising. One is is, uh, it made people really anxious. So if you look at the last from uh, 2011, you know, you'll see these bumps up and down in terms of anxiety. There's some times when there's anxiety. But then you see what happened when COVID started and anxiety, average anxiety doubled, more than doubled any, from any period in the past. And it maintained that and it's probably still above average in terms of just the language they're using, talking about anything. Uh, there, were, there were changes in other emotions and there were changes in the way people think. Remember, I've been talking about this logical, formal way people think. When under a lot of stress, people become stupid. We stop thinking in this complex, organized way. And what we found was you track you track uh, this analytic thinking, and then COVID hits, and we drop, the culture drops tremendously and stays at that low level. And that has taken months and months. We're just about back to where we were before pre-COVID. So let me ask you, when you say that analytical thinking has dropped, what kind of thinking are we doing? What has replaced that thinking? So uh, what's replaced that is what, we, what 
we call working through or it's a, it's a general cognitive process where we're trying to figure things out. We're spending more time, you know, obsessing about things. Where can I get more toilet paper? How can I, uh, you know, how am I going to deal with my next door neighbor? And, you know, and all of these things. So we're just, our mind is busy, but we're not standing back and looking at the way in this more structured way that we did in the past in general. But doesn't this, that make sense? I mean, isn't it kind of survival mode because we're dealing with something yeah. we've never dealt with before? It, that, that's exactly right. But it also means that we make more errors. We, you know, if, if, and we find the same thing, by the way, another wonderful project that one of my other students did, Sara Siraj, looking at breakups. She tracked when people go through a relationship breakup because Reddit has a breakup uh, subreddit. And what we can do is we can see how they think analytically as the breakup is coming. And starting three months before the breakup, we see they start, their analytic thinking starts to drop and drop and drop until the breakup. And then it takes about six months for people to get back to normal. And this is even among people who claim they had no idea that the other person was going to dump them. But their language certainly suggested that they did on some level. But, mm. you know, but that it makes same me think, level of drop is the same that we see with COVID. Yeah, it makes me think, too, going back to leaders, it would be interesting to track the language of leaders during COVID to see whether they were able to maintain some kind of analytical thinking, right? Because you would hope so. You would hope, would hope they would. So. This might shock you, but we had a president who was not very high in analytic thinking. No. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure how much you've got. So. Um, and now you, you're you currently uh, working on something. It's called expressive interviewing, I believe. I'm, yeah. Well, this is with a group at the University of Michigan in computer science. Uh, Radha Mihalchia is a professor there, and one of her students, uh, Charlie Welch, uh, with uh, was involved in putting this together. This is a lovely project where we're trying to get a computer to interview people and ask them questions much the way um, expressive writing would. So it one, one thing we did was with COVID in the middle of this, the, the computer program would say, I'm a computer program. And in fact, you can call me CP, short for computer program. And I'd like to ask you some questions. And all the questions are open-ended. So for example, how has uh, COVID been affecting you? And a person might type, this has been a really difficult time. Uh, you know, I've lost, uh, not working, and my family is uh, we're very worried. And, I don't know, and then the computer is tracking all the words that, that are being said and will pick up on some, some dimension. So it might say, it seems as though that you've got a lot of stress surrounding your family. Say some more about that. And then after about three questions, then the computer will say, oh, thank you for that. I'd, I'd like to switch topics. How do you feel about, and so what it's doing is it's really getting people to be self-reflective the way that expressive writing was, but it takes advantage of some of the principles of motivational interviewing. Yeah. It sounds almost people, like therapy to me. It, no, it's a, it is a, it's, it's a, you could almost think of it as a form of therapy. Yeah. A, do you know, James, oh, sorry. I, yeah. I was just, because it made me think. I mean, I, I would think that you're doing this because you're hoping that it will help people. It will benefit people the same way expressive writing did, right? That's right. Yeah. Have you ever done the reverse of expressive writing? So now that you know what kinds of words uh, reflect a sort of healthy writing, have you had people intentionally use those words for a period of time to see, in fact, whether they could have a better health outcome intentionally, not so, accidentally or whatever. Or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had done several abortive studies trying to, to show that, and it doesn't work. And it was one of the most instructive experiences. And that is language reflects how we think. Language does not drive how we think. Mm -hmm. So um, a good example of this, you can imagine. So one thing that's interesting is you can put people into a room together and one of them is going to end up being the leader. And the person who becomes the leader will use I words at lower rates 
than the people who are not leaders. You, you can take that to the bank. That really holds up. Now, I can do an experiment where there's going to be a group of, let's say, three people. And beforehand, you talk to one of them and say, okay, you're going to go in this group. When you go in, the only thing I ask is don't use I words. Use we words and you words, but don't use I words. And they go, okay. And they go in and they can do it. Did they become the leader? No. Or it'll be at the same, you know, the same chance mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. However, if you say, look, you're about to go in there and I really need to have you be the leader. So if you could try to, you know, in a gentle way, kind of become the leader. So they'll go in and they will do much better than chance in becoming the leader and they will not use I words. In other words, the language follows the psychological state. So that's the cause and effect there. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I so enjoyed this discussion, Jamie, and uh, I wish you all the best with your, your future work and hope to hear more about it. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Jamie. That's Jamie Pennebaker. He is a social psychologist and professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas in Austin. And uh, his one of his most popular books, if you're interested in getting it, is called The Secret Life of Pronouns, What Our Words Say About Us. If you'd like to know more about Jamie's work, check out our show notes. Thanks for joining us. And uh, until next time, take care.